you're doing right now. Cells themselves can grow in size, but let's put it in perspective now. A multicellular organism isn't growing because each individual cell is getting bigger. A multicellular organism itself grows by making more cells, by the cells making more cells by dividing. That's cell reproduction. One reason that you are bigger than you were when you were five, unless you are five, is because your cells have divided to make more cells. Mitosis and the cytokinesis that follows that splits the cytoplasm allows you to make new body cells, but you don't want that cell division happening all the time. Why? It is likely that you've heard the term cancer before. We have had family members that have battled cancer before. It is definitely a relevant topic for all of us. Cancer is in part due to cells that divide too frequently. The cells are not regulated. They are uncontrolled. Cancer cells can have other problems too. They might not be able to communicate with other healthy cells. They may not be able to carry out normal cell functions. They may not securely anchor themselves like other cells do, which can make them more likely to travel somewhere else. Some cancer cells have the ability to secrete their own growth hormone that makes blood vessels divert over to those cancer cells and supply the cancer cell with nutrients, which can take nutrients away from healthy cells. Why do cancer cells become this way? Well, there's a lot of research in this area. With some cancers, there may be genetic links, making some cells more susceptible to having problems. These genetic factors might run in families. Exposure to toxins, radiation, excessive exposure to UV light, all of these can be risk factors for some cells to become cancerous. The uncontrolled growth that cancer cells have gives rise to more cells like them, which can develop into a tumor. Some tumors stay put, but some do not. Now, the good news is that scientists continue to develop better treatments, which include destroying the cancer cells with radiation or medication, such as chemotherapy, which will target cells that divide frequently. Maybe someday you will be part of helping to meet the challenge of trying to eliminate cancer, because the fact remains that these cells are not participating in the cell cycle like they should. So what is the cell cycle? The cell cycle is often represented as a pie chart like this. Cells are either in one of two different phases, a phase called interphase, where the cells themselves are growing, replicating their DNA, doing their cell functions, or they are in M phase, which includes mitosis and the actual splitting of the cytoplasm, cytokinesis. So this M phase is where cells actually divide to make more cells, but cells spend most of their time in interphase. So most of the time, they're not dividing. Now, depending on what kind of cell, it might do mitosis more or less often. For example, your hair follicle cells do mitosis frequently, which is why your hair can grow at the rate that it does. It's also why many cancer drugs may also target hair follicle cells because many cancer drugs go after cells that do cell division frequently. It's a big deal for cells to hit this M phase. If a cell has an error, a harmful mutation, for example, you do not want it to divide because then it will create another cell that has this same issue. That's where checkpoints come in handy. Along the cell cycle, there are checkpoints to check that the cell is growing well and replicating its DNA correctly and doing everything it's supposed to do correctly before it divides. To better understand those checkpoints, let's further divide the cell cycle pie chart. We have G1, S, G2, all three of those are part of interphase. Then we have M phase where mitosis will happen. During G1, the cell individually itself grows. Then it replicates its DNA in S phase. You can remember that because the S is for synthesis, which means to make something and it's making DNA. Then G2, the cell grows some more in preparation for mitosis. So let's take a look at checkpoints. We've got one here in G1. This checkpoint checks, is the cell growing well enough? Is its DNA damaged? Because if it is, you definitely don't want it to move on to S phase where it would replicate DNA. Does the cell have the resources it needs if it were to keep moving on? This checkpoint in G2 checks if the DNA was replicated correctly back in S phase. Is it growing well enough? Does it have the resources it needs to continue? Okay then, moving on. This next checkpoint in M phase is my favorite checkpoint. It checks in the stage metaphase to make sure the chromosomes, which are made of DNA, 
are lined up in the middle correctly, that they're all attached to the spindle correctly, because if they're not, the chromosomes will not be separated correctly. So now you may have two big questions. First, what happens if the cell doesn't meet the requirements of the checkpoint? And second, what is doing the regulating of this cycle anyway? To address the first question, if the reason the cell can't go past the checkpoint is a reason that can be fixed, the cell may kind of pause here until it can fix that issue. But if it can't be fixed, then the cell does something called apoptosis, which basically means the cell self-destructs. This ensures that a cell that is damaged beyond repair will not go on to divide. So what is doing the regulating anyway? We've mentioned before that proteins are a big deal. Genes in your body can code for proteins that do an assortment of functions, and there are many proteins involved with regulating the cell cycle. Some of them are positive regulators because they allow moving forward in the cycle, and some are negative regulators that might make things stop. The proteins themselves can be sensitive to cues inside and outside of the cell. So, for example, two proteins that are involved in positive regulation are cyclin and CDK. CDK is specifically an enzyme protein, a fancy kind called a kinase, which is worth a Google. CDK can have different forms of cyclin protein bound to it. Different types of cyclin rise and fall throughout the cell cycle. And the rising and falling is based on a variety of signals to determine when the cell should move on to the next cell cycle phase. Typically, each cell cycle phase, G1, S, G2, M, will tend to have a different cyclin binding with the CDK. The rise and fall of cyclin types and the role CDK has when it's active is a fascinating subject to explore. Remember that vocabulary word we said, apoptosis? Proteins that are negative regulators, for example, a protein called P53, can be involved in initiating apoptosis. Again, we encourage you to explore beyond the video. One last thing to mention. There are some cells that don't go through the phases we mentioned because they're actually in G0. That's a zero, by the way, and not an O, because if it was an O, then it's a go, and G0 is kind of the opposite of that. G0 is a resting phase. Now, cells here are still performing cell functions, but they're not preparing to divide. Some cells go here temporarily, maybe if there's not enough resources around, for example. But some, like many types of neurons in your brain and spinal cord, may stay here permanently. If they stay here permanently, they'll never get to M phase, so they will not divide. This can be one reason why a major injury to the brain or spinal cord can have challenges with healing, as many of those cells may not be able to replicate, a topic that definitely continues to be researched. Well. That's it for the Meba Sisters, and we remind you to animal, animal cells, cells are enclosed in a plasma, plasma membrane, membrane, which consists of two layers of phospholipids. The hydrophobic nature of the cell membrane makes it intrinsically permeable to small nonpolar and uncharged polar molecules, but non-permeable to large polar molecules and charged particles. Charged particles, such as ions, must use special channels to move through the membrane. Transport of a molecule can be passive or active. Passive transport does not require energy input because it moves the molecules downhill, for example, from higher to lower concentration. Active transport, on the other hand, moves the molecules against their gradients and therefore requires energy expenditure. Ion channels permit passive transport of ions. These are transmembrane proteins that form pores for ions to pass through. Most ion channels are specific for a certain type of ion. Ion channels can be classified by how they change their open, closed state in response to different factors of the environment. Common types of ion channels include leak channels. These channels are almost always open, allowing more or less steady flow of ions. Examples are potassium and sodium leak channels in neurons. Ligand-gated ion channels. These channels open upon binding of a ligand. They are most commonly found at synapses, where neurons communicate via chemical messages, or neurotransmitters. An example is the GABA receptor, a chloride channel located on postsynaptic neurons. It opens upon binding to GABA, a neurotransmitter released by the presynaptic neuron, and allows chloride ions to flow into the cell. Voltage-gated ion channels. These channels are regulated by membrane voltage, 
they open at some values of the membrane potential and close at others. These are the channels that underlie action potentials in neurons and cardiac muscles. Active transport of ions is carried out by ion transporters or ion pumps. These are transmembrane proteins that pump ions against their concentration gradient using cellular energy, such as ATP. Most notable example is the sodium-potassium pump which maintains the rusting potential in neurons by pumping two potassium in and three sodium out of the cell. Another type of ion transporters, known as secondary transporters, do not use ATP directly. Instead, they move one ion down its concentration gradient and use that energy to power the transport of a second ion. Symporters transport the two ions in the same direction, while antiporters pump the coupled molecule in the opposite direction. This is called Real Microscopic Mitosis and I found it on YouTube. Once a cell has gone through interphase, it's doubled its DNA, it's made extra mitochondria and endoplasmic reticulum and all the things it needs in order to split and be two different cells. So now we're going into mitosis. During interphase, we couldn't see any chromosomes. We needed our chromosomes relaxed into chromatin so that we could read it. We could use the genes to make proteins and all of those other things. You cannot do when the DNA is coiled up into a chromosome. But once you've decided to divide, you need to get your chromosomes packed up so that you can easily split half of it, put it one way and half the other way. So it coils up into what we call chromosomes. So when you see a cell that looks like this on the screen, this is in prophase. So it has committed and decided that it's going to do mitosis. It's coiled up its DNA. And if you look around the edges, you'll see that the nuclear envelope is dissolving. So anytime you see chromosomes that aren't doing anything in particular and the nuclear envelope is dissolving, you've got prophase. Then if we start this back up again, you see them jockeying for position and you see them start to line up across the middle of the cell. All right, this phase, when they line up across the middle, is called metaphase. It's the second phase of mitosis. So M-E-T-A, metaphase. And this is what it looks like. If you look carefully, you can actually see that there's two chromosomes for each one of these. And you see that they're held together by a centromere, which is kind of like a little piece of protein Velcro that's holding them together. Here it is holding these two together. So the next phase after metaphase is, wait for it, wait for it, snap. That's anaphase. What happened, there are proteins that are pulling on the chromosomes in this direction and pulling on the chromosomes in that direction. And if they pull hard enough, they'll pull that centromere apart and it will be like your Velcro let go and half of the chromosomes will go one direction and half of the chromosomes will go the other direction. So when you see that centromere divide and half start going one way and half going the other, you have entered anaphase. So this is anaphase and if you watch, they'll continue. The proteins will pull them to the edges of the cell and you'll see the cell start uh, coming in or uh, invaginating in the middle. All right, there you go, anaphase, anaphase. And now you're getting into what we call telophase, which is the final phase. At this point, the chromosomes, half are one way, half are the other way. And you start to see the cell plate or the cell membrane forming and it's going to make it into two different cells. So this is definitely telophase. 
this is a different set of cells and if you see in this one they've stained the DNA kind of a golden color and you can actually see the proteins that are going to be pulling the chromosomes around in this particular picture if you look this is in interphase and the reason I know is I can see the nuclear envelope and I do not see any chromosomes here I see the nuclear envelope I do not see any chromosomes so this is unraveled into chromatin so I know that it's an interphase however these three are already in metaphase with the chromosomes lined up across the middle that's the easiest phase to detect and you see these proteins that are going to be pulling it so if we start the video back up again you see these are starting into prophase so I can see the chromosomes that are starting to form so this is very early prophase and this one is in anaphase because see half of the chromosomes are moving this way and half of the chromosomes are moving that way these are still in metaphase they're waiting for the centromere to divide to release them so that these proteins can pull them all right continuing on now these are in metaphase this is in telophase and you can see that there's starting to be a, a gap in between here so this is going to become two different cells here's one cell here's one cell this is telophase right here and this is late anaphase early telophase depends on who you talk to which textbook you're looking at so here we have late telophase 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 and these are still both in metaphase in the middle this next concept I want you to understand in chapter 4 is called Brownian motion and this is where you have milk under a slide uh, Robert Brown looked at pollen in water under a slide but you'll know back then they didn't know what this was some people thought that maybe these are living organisms kinda like what you would see in a pond sample some people thought that maybe it was a mirage kinda like on a road on a hot day causing maybe a little rippled appearance but Albert Einstein at the age of 26 in 1905 he was single-handedly able to demonstrate that this was actually atomic theory visible with the eye. Albert Einstein said that atoms are vibrating and the atoms are kind of bumping into these little bubbles and you can see the bubbles kind of knocking around like this. It's kind of like if you were to go to a concert and there was a mosh pit, you would be knocked around as So I showed you a little bit of a video with a man talking about Brownian motion and how Einstein um, really got excited about it and wrote papers. But basically what Brownian motion is that all atoms, all molecules, all things are constantly in motion at all times. And so you can look at it uh, like this man did. He put some milk under the microscope and he watched the little blobs of fat that are suspended in the milk moving around. The third concept that I want you guys to understand is osmosis. So you can take a piece of dialysis tube and it can simulate your cell or any other semi-permeable membrane, meaning some things can pass through and some things cannot. So here is someone tying off the end of a piece of dialysis tubing. Now he's going to open it up and he's going to fill it with a solution. If you think about all the things that are inside of a cell, there are proteins, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, you've got your DNA, you've got your nucleus, you have all of your um, organelles that are in there, you've got your waste, 
Now, if you put water inside of this tube, there's no stuff in it. You don't have organelles. You don't have all of that other stuff. It is just water. There's just a little hint of chlorine. There's a little hint of fluorine, fluoride, uh, maybe a little tiny, tiny bit of uh, sodium or potassium or something like that. But basically, there's nothing much in there. All right, after you've added your fluid, then you tie it off, and you can take this, which is just water, and put it into a beaker that has a lot of salt or sugar or something like that. And so we say that there's a lot of stuff in the beaker, and there's not much stuff inside of the bag. So when you have a situation like that, you have to say one of them is hypertonic and one is hypotonic. So the hypertonic is the one that has the most stuff. Hyper is too much activity, too much of anything. So in this experiment, they weighed the tube and it weighed 36 grams. Now you put it into the hyper tonic solution and what's going to happen is the the outside is hypertonic because it has a lot of solution the inside is hypotonic because it does not have the solution in it and the water will go from the tube this dialysis tubing out and try to dilute all the stuff out here so two things that you need to know Whichever side has the most stuff is hyper, and water will always go into the hyper direction. So in our lab, we did this experiment where we had no stuff, no salt, no sugar inside the tube, but we had quite a bit outside. We had 40% outside. So the water was sucked out of the tube, and you could weigh it before and then you could watch as the water was sucked out and then you could weigh the bag afterward and you would see that the water had been taken out of the bag because it was hypotonic. Then we did the opposite. We put high salt concentration, 40% salt concentration inside the bag. So there's a lot of stuff inside the bag and we put it in a beaker of pure water and there's nothing much in pure water. So there's not much stuff. So in that situation where you have the most stuff is inside the bag. So the bag is hypertonic and the solution you put it in is hypotonic. In this situation, the water it will always go in the hyper direction. So the water will be pulled into the bag and the bag will get larger and larger and larger. So if you weigh it beforehand and then you weigh it after, you're going to find that it got um, really heavy because it sucked water in. So water always goes in the hyper direction. And the thing that is hypertonic is the uh, in that particular case, the dialysis bag because there's more stuff there. Now, why this is so incredibly important is if you go into a hospital and they hook you up to an IV bag that's empty of anything but water, the water will go into your body and it will actually cause your cells to swell up because they've got more stuff in them than the water that's outside and you can actually rupture the cells and kill a person so for this reason we never ever give anybody an IV of water you're going to put some stuff in the IV bag you can put salt 0.9 percent which is called normal saline and now you have the same amount of stuff not the same stuff but the same amount of stuff outside the cells as inside the cells so you can safely put a person on an IV and leave them on it because they are isotonic to each other the same amount inside the bag or the cells and outside the cells you could also make an IV of glucose which would be called dextrose anywhere else in the world 
So the dextrose, you know how much you need to add to the water so that you can make an IV that will be isotonic to the patient's cells. So they can get the nourishment of the sugar without popping their cells or without sucking the water out of their cells.